Okay. Uh, this is seasonality of red tide. Now, question, this is a little bit misleading because every year is different. Okay, but this is just an average. Okay, and from January through December, blue is rainfall, so here's your dry season, here's your wet season, back to dry. Orange is flow down the Clusatchee River, and then red is the size of the algoma, of the red tide, specifically the algae. There's a large lag here because it's a slow growing algae, okay, but you can see that correlation. And again, it's a little bit misleading because there's other things going on. It doesn't happen like that every year. But what I'm going to do is show you three sequences. We're going to look at the year 2001. Okay. And basically, here's flow down the river, uh, Clusac River, from uh, basically the dry season, the wet season, dry season. That's the Clusac River. Sorry. Here's the Peace River. Okay. Ignore the left hand side, just look at the right hand side here. Okay, uh, black dots mean a sample was taken and there was no red tide. The larger the red dot, the higher the abundance of red tide. So we just go month by month during the dry season. January, now here's February, March, April, May. Okay, oh, the other thing is. This is Sarasota, by the way. Yeah, I figured that. Right there, yeah, Sarasota there, yeah. Here's the Peace River, here's the Clusa River, and the width of the blue line here tells you how much water is coming down the river. So now we're in the wet season, and now you can see the riptide developing, and coastal currents are carrying it along the coastline there. And then we get back in the dry season and it dwindles away. Okay, here I'm gonna look at 2000 and uh, Six, it's Clusash River flow, Peace River flow. Okay, start out in the dry season. Pretty boring, month by month. It's May, June, beginning of the wet season. You see a little bit of red tide right there at the mouth of Clusash River. And then it expands over time. Okay, now we're gonna look at 2004. That's when four hurricanes hit Florida. Three of them went over the watershed of the Clusiatchee, the watersheds of Clusiatchee and the Peace Rivers. So massive amounts of water coming down those rivers. So we start out in the dry season. Okay, now, and I guess it was August that uh, Hurricane Charlie hit uh, Punta Gorda. See large amounts of water coming down. September, no data. I either everyone's afraid to go out in the Gulf to, to uh, sample because of all the hurricanes are around or else their boats have sunk. I'm not sure which. No data. But massive amounts of water. Just a little bit of red tide there. Down to the south. And now even further to the south. And even further to the south. What's going on? Okay. Well, if you look at the set imagery, there's such massive amounts of water coming down the Pusatch River. You see this huge plume here, huge amounts of nutrients, but the, the red tide doesn't like fresh water. It can't live in that fresh water. You just pump so much fresh water out in the Gulf. So what's happening is it's living right there at the edge of that plume where you're getting the nutrients, but there's still high enough salt that it can live. Now, eventually, this bloom developed it last year, throughout all of 2005 into 2006, like 17 months, really long uh, red tide. Uh, Columbine, so we know the red tide is in this area here, and my colleague, Josefina, she did, did some computer modeling with a physical charge. You can essentially run the models backwards to see where that water came from, and not surprisingly, that water came from the mouth of the Clusatch River. That's where the nutrients are coming from. Okay, one of the health effects of the red tide, you already know this. An issue is called neurotoxic shellfish poison because if you ate the shellfish, uh, you would get very sick. That happens very rarely now because the state does a good job of notifying. Basically, they shut down any shellfish harvesting when you've got red tide around. They monitor for that, so that's very rare. And honestly enough, and I'll come back to this in a second, if you look at the hospital records during times of red tide, you'll see like a 40% increase in people going to the hospital for gastrointestinal disorders. And I'll come back to why I think that might be. 
The major effect these days is that that toxin gets into the air. It's an aerosol, it irritates your eyes, nose, throats, and lungs, and so on. And again, you look at the hospital records, there's like a 50% increase in people going to the hospital for various types of respiratory distress. Okay, this is probably my most complex slide, but it's not too difficult. This is a concentration frequency spectra. What we're looking at here is what fraction of the samples do you find no red tie? The blue is what it looked like 50 years ago, and the red is what it looks like today. So 50 years ago, 70% of the samples would see no red tide, and now we're down to 40% of no red tide. Up to 1,000 cells per liter is considered natural background concentrations. You don't have any harmful effects or anything. And again, it's also declined. Above 1,000 cells per liter, now we're starting to see elevated levels of red tide. Okay? And now you see these elevated levels are much more frequent than that, what they were 50 years ago. Now what everyone focuses on is anything over about 100,000 cells per liter. Okay? At that point, there's enough red tide in the water, you can actually see the discoloration in the water. It's enough to kill the fish, you see dead fish, and we can actually see it by satellite. Okay? People can get sick and so on. And you also you know, you get the respiratory distress. So everyone focuses on anything over 100,000 cells per liter. Clearly that's increased over the last 50 years. But notice, below 100,000 cells per liter, this is also increased in frequency quite a bit. These are what we call sublethal concentrations. The red tide's there, the toxin's there, but it's not enough to kill the, red, the fish. Now, my gut feeling is people sort of have this rule of thumb, well, you know, you catch a fish, it's alive, must be okay to eat. If you drain red tide, you see a dead fish, you know it's packed full of bravotoxin. Well, maybe not, because the red tide's still there, it's just you can't see it in the water. You don't see any discoloration, you don't see any dead fish. But my colleague, Jerome Nor did a study, a bunch of fish in the bay, no red tide. Now I know you can't see the numbers anything, but look at like 30 different species. They all have moderate, sub-lethal concentrations of brevotoxin in them. Okay? And what we're seeing now are dolphins out in the Gulf dying. There's no red tide around. But you do the autopsy and they're packed full of rabotoxin. I think what's happening is that uh, they're eating all these fish that are still alive. They have sublethal concentration of rabotoxin. And it's just like methylmercury. It just slowly accumulates in your body. You can't get rid of it. You accumulate enough and nothing until eventually it kills the dolphin. So I, I suspect that might be why we're seeing a lot more people with gastrointestinal disorders. Do you well, think they're eating these sublethal concentrations. Do you think that's hepatic? Uh, no, that's, that's a different issue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So now I want to, that's the real time. Now I want to go back to the blue green algae. What about the health effects of these blue green algae? And I hear you're getting more water right here in Sarasota Bay and yeah. Lemon Bay as well. So this is a concern. So the Florida Bay, that was blue green algae. Lake Okeechobee, that's blue green algae. That's the surface view of it. Cloisette River, that's blue green algae. That's the famous Quacaboli bloom and, and uh, St. Lucie estuary two, two and a half, three years ago. It's all blue green algae. Okay, well, we know that the blue green algae can produce a number of different toxins. The one that's best known is microcystin, but there are a number of other known toxins as well. I'm going to focus on microcystin here for a second. Um, it's known to kill a lot of animals, humans, leads to short-term gastrointestinal disorders. This is the molecule here. It was actually discovered over 100 years ago in Australia when a bunch of sheep died. Okay? And people go find out what caused, what killed all these sheep all of a sudden. Well, they're all drinking from this pond over here, and there's a big bloom of the green algae in that pond. They look at that species, and scientists discover this molecule. Okay. Well, once you start studying that molecule, that toxin, and what it does biochemically to organisms, what leads to the death, you discover it has other effects. Right? These are fairly rapid. You know, if you get a large amount of microcystin, you die fairly quickly, or you get gastrointestinal disorders within a few hours or, or a day or so. But once you study it, you discover it can also lead to long-term liver damage. It's a tumor promoter and can lead to things like liver cancer. 
Now think about what would happen if you had a toxin that did not have any immediate health effects, but only led to, say, liver cancer 10 or 20 years later. How would you ever discover that? Because now the people are dying of liver cancer at different times and places. You'd never be able to track it back to their exposure to this blue-green algae bloom 10 or 20 years earlier. And that's my concern. How many other toxins have we not discovered? Because the reality is virtually all the toxins we have discovered produced by different types of algae are the ones that have fairly immediate effects. Classic case, a bunch of people get sick, and you find out, well, they all ate at a certain restaurant last night, and they all ate the clams. And you, where those clams get harvested from? Well, there's a certain estuary over here, and sure enough, there's an algal in there, and you study, you find a toxin produced by those algae. What about toxins that do not have any short-term effects, but do have long-term effects? Well, by accident, we think we've discovered one. Okay, well, let me back up. Uh, if you just think about, in general, what you know, all these compounds produced by algae, what could they do? Well, some of them just smell bad. Some compounds make, if it's in the drinking water supply, it just makes the water taste bad. You go swimming in the water, it can uh, irritate your skin. Can cause gastrointestinal disorders, and these are and neurological problems. These are all short-term effects. You know right away you're being exposed to it. You get the red tide. I know it sounds odd, but I call that a good toxin because you know right away you're getting exposed to the red tide toxin. You just get away from the beach, unless of course you live on the beach, then you got a problem. Uh, but long-term liver damage, neurodegenerative diseases, or cancer. If you've got a compound that leads to these you're not gonna know for another 10 or 20 years. That's much more insidious. So here's a compound we think uh, is doing this, called BMAA. Okay, it's shown to be produced, like, I can't, I can't see it, but virtually all blue green algae produce this compound called BMAA. And there's increased evidence now it can lead to neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. Okay, and the point is, here, don't worry about the details, basically, these are only about 5% genetic. It's gotta be primarily an environmental cause to these diseases, a trigger or something okay, that's leading to these diseases. The exception is Hutchinson's disease, that is 100% genetic. We know the gene involved in that. You can hear it that. But these others, for the most part, you do not inherit these others. There's got to be some type of environmental factor involved for the most part. And they're called tangle diseases because the characteristic is you get these protein tangles accumulated in your brain until it eventually kills off much of your brain. I'll come back to that. Well, this, the medical stuff is not my research. I'm, this is other people. And it is published many papers on this now, yes. It's just some of the characteristic protein tangles that accumulate in people's brains. Okay, how this got discovered was uh, after World War II, there was a 150-fold increase in the incidence of neurodegenerative diseases among the native Chamorro people of Guam. Okay? At that time, um, Americans and Japanese were fighting over the islands of the Western Pacific, including Guam, and so the Chamorro people were in bad shape in the middle of this uh, war, so they had not too much food, and so they started eating fruit bats. Now, it's pretty hard to catch a fruit bat, except for the first time during the war, they had access to guns. So they went around shooting the fruit bats. And what they did is they drove the fruit bats to extinction. Here's a, a bunch of fruit bats before the war, and then by the end of the war, they'd basically driven the fruit bats to extinction. So they started eating all these fruit bats. Okay, well, at that time, uh, people, uh, a lot of medical researchers looked into it, they discovered the existence of BMAA in the plants, but not the, the bats at that time, and they couldn't figure out what was going on, so they sort of gave up on it. And then about 15 years ago, another person by the name of Paul Cox, he's an ethnobotanist, not a traditional uh, medical researcher, he went, lived with the people learning more about this, learned their language and everything, and he came up with the following hypothesis. He came to the conclusion that bats were a major factor here. And what he found, was that, he calls them flying foxes, but they're really fruit bats. 
found very high concentrations of BMA in these fruit bats. What happens is a, a, a concentration, and you have these cyanobacteria, blue green algae, living symbiotic on the superficial roots of these cycad trees, which is sort of unique to this particular species, unique to Guam. And you got biomagnified, BMA gets biomagnified from the blue green algae into the plants, the cycads, and into their seeds, and the fruit bats then eat these seeds. So the Chamorro people, not, not the Americans or Asians living on the island of Guam, just the native Chamorro people which, who were eating the fruit bats. You see this 150 fold incidence of neurodegenerative disease. Some villages, up to 20% of the people died from these neurodegenerative diseases. If you now look at the BMA in their brains, you see high levels of BMA in these Chamorro people who are eating the fruit bats. You look at controls, these are Canadians who died of something else, no BMA in their brain. But now here's two Canadians who died of Alzheimer's. You see BMA in their brain. Presumably these Canadians are not eating fruit bats from Guam. So it says it's not just this unusual food chain in Guam, there's other pathways of getting BMA into your brain. So my colleague, Deborah Mash, at the University of Miami Medical School, she runs a brain bank there. So she takes a bunch of Americans who died of Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's, I'm sorry, of ALS or Alzheimer's, and you see high levels of BMA. And yet there's some of these people are not eating fruit bats from Guam. Controls down here, no BMA. Now you could still argue what's the cause and effect. In theory, you could argue that if you've got a neurodegenerative disease that allows your brain to accumulate BMA, and if you don't have it, you don't accumulate it. But that's where Huntington's disease come in. That's a genetic disorder. And they do not, Huntington's does not have BMA. So that tells you it's the environment, that BMA is an environmental cause lead to the, uh, the neurodegenerative disease. So now let's go back to Florida. Bay. Remember, remember those fruit bats, around 3,500 is a concentration of BMA. Go back to Florida Bay, got a couple of shrimp from that area. Here's one 3,000, another one 1,500, okay? Okay, I did talk about this bloom, what caused it, but we had a bloom, uh, blue-green algae in uh, southern Biscayne Bay, uh, and uh, it developed in 2005, lasted to about 2008. This is before the bloom, and then after the bloom, or during the bloom, I should say. Huge increase in blue-green algae. And again, well, back up. Uh, I didn't have any samples at the time. Uh, I wasn't working on BMA at the time. But uh, once, once I got interested in BMA, I sort of looked around with my colleagues, anybody had any samples. And I didn't find anything down here, but I had a colleague who did have some samples up in here in 2008, toward the end of the bloom, it was just dying back. So it's not an ideal sample. And so not surprising, there's a lot of variability in the data, because animals move around and so on. But we find a blue crab here, 7,000, twice as high as the fruit bats from Guam. There's another blue crab, 5,000. Here's a puffer fish, 7,000. Clusatch River, it blooms along the Clusatch River there. So we've got some fish, and basically they range from about 500 to 2,500. You don't want to eat the fish out of the Clusatch River. Okay, uh, this neutral rich water with the blooms, blue green algae also goes down the St. Lucie Canal, down to the estuary where you saw that guacamole bloom, and into the southern Indian River Lagoon. So I wanted to go to the very top of the food chain, okay? So what I did was I got brain tissue from bottlenose dolphins and it died in the Indian River Lagoon. The Indian River Lagoon is notorious having a high mortality of uh, of bottlenose dolphins. It's an endangered species, I had to get a permit. It took me about a year to get the permit, but I got the brain tissue. And the advantage of this is also because it's an endangered species, every time they find a dead dolphin, they do a full autopsy to find out what killed it. Well, that just shows the bloom. Okay, so we have brain tissue from six dolphins. Okay, this one here did not have any BMA in its brain, but the autopsy should have been hit by a boat. That was the cause of death. The other five hit by a boat. 
The other five have high concentrations of BMA comparable to what you see of, say, Alzheimer's, people who died of Alzheimer's and so on. The autopsies could not find any obvious cause of death. There was no other toxins, or not hit by a boat or anything like that. And I've talked to two people who studied behavior of dolphins in the early and they've told me they have seen dolphins on occasion that just they seem confused, they get lost, uh, swimming up freshwater uh, rivers and so on. Sounds just like an Alzheimer's patient. Okay. Get the mechanism real quick. If you remember a little bit of your biology. Okay, well, the mechanism, remember BMA is actually a small molecule, unusually small. It's an unusual amino acid. Now, we all need about 20 basic amino acids to get to build all the proteins in our body. Well, BMA looks very similar to serine. So as you're building your proteins, the transfer RNA that takes the amino acids and puts them into your proteins will get, if there's a lot of BMA in your diet, it'll get confused and accidentally put BMA instead of serine into your protein. So the more BMA in your diet, the more BMA going into your proteins. The three-dimensional structure and the function of your proteins depends upon that, that sequence of amino acids. That's, that's what your DNA does. It, determines what the sequence of amino acids is. So if you put the wrong amino acids in, well, see here's, the slick use a representation of your normal protein, it's gonna function properly. Put the wrong amino acid in, put BMA instead of serine, it tangles up. It doesn't fold up properly, it doesn't function. And in many cases, once you get these protein tangles, the cells can't get rid of them. You start accumulating them. It's exactly what happens in neurodegenerative diseases. It takes maybe 10 or 20 years, but you slowly accumulate more and more of these protein tangles until eventually you know, it just kills off more and more of your brain cells. Okay, finish up here now. Uh, the pharmaceutical, and you think about it, penicillin and most of the drugs we use, they initially came from organisms. A lot of organisms use toxins naturally as, you know, as a sort of competition against other species and so on. Okay, and so the pharmaceutical industry has put a huge amount of effort looking for new antibiotics. As you probably have heard, we're starting to run out. But you know, they put a lot of effort looking for new antibiotics, anti-cancer compounds. So, so they go around surveying all the species in the coral reefs, the rainforests, all over the world, looking for new compounds. Well, they looked at cyanobacteria too looking for antibiotics, anti-cancer compounds, etc., And they have discovered over a thousand different unusual compounds produced by cyanobacteria. All kinds of strange structures. Almost certainly a lot of those are toxins used in competition with other species and so on. But the vast majority have no idea what they may do, but no research. Okay, so again, Lots of strange structures being produced by these blue-green algae. So if you're exposed to these blooms of blue-green algae, you're getting exposed to those compounds. Okay? Well, the ones, the toxins we discover are the ones that have short-term effects. You know right away, and we can discover pretty easily. The concern is toxins that have no short-term effects but only can lead long-term liver damage, neurodegenerative diseases, or cancer. That's much more insidious. And so it's a big unknown right now, in these blooms of blue-green algae, how many out of those thousand compounds produced by blue-green algae, how many of them might be producing these things which you're not gonna find out for another 10 or 20 years what it might do to your health. So my view, ignore what people say, whether they measure or don't measure microcystin in the blooms around here. My recommendation, you just assume that those blooms probably have toxins in them. You don't want to go swimming in that water, you don't want to eat any of the seafood out of that water. Okay, and I'll stop there. And, uh, what about the aerosol? Good question, yeah. Now, the red tide, we know that toxin gets into the air. That's well studied. Okay, it makes people sick. Uh, what we don't know yet very much is whether these other toxins, like BMA, microcystin, gets into the air. And, and so we're doing that research right now. And I can't, we don't have enough data to really say for sure what you know, how much risk there is. But there was a concern, though, because uh, in addition to these type of studies, uh, my colleagues have done statistical studies, epidemiological studies. For example, my colleague Elijah Stommel up in New England, Dartmouth Medical Center, 
<laughs> he works mostly on ALS patients, and he did a statistical study, and he found out that people who live near lakes that have blooms of blue-green algae in the summer have a 25-fold greater chance of coming down with ALS. And people, uh, over, and they've seen similar studies, of similar uh, things in, in France and in Sweden as well. So there's more and more studies showing this connection. Now you could argue, well, if you live near the lake, you're more likely to eat the fish from the lake, but it could be that you're just breathing the air. Now what we do know, like last summer, people in Fort Myers were getting sick when they were exposed. You know, they were not swimming in the water, they were not eating the fish. They were just living next to these dead-end canals that had the blooms. They were getting sick. Some of them actually had to abandon their homes. We saw the same thing three years ago when they had that guacamole bloom in San Lucy yesterday in the Stewart area. So almost certainly there's other toxins in these blooms that we don't even know about. Okay, so you, you just assume these things are probably toxic. You want to avoid it as much as possible. Thank you.